Amen, amen, amen. Um, okay, so last week we had two testimonies. I already shared that, uh, that were shared. It was Molly and Will, and they were super powerful. If you haven't seen those two already, I would highly recommend that you go back and watch that particular week because it really sets the stage for this week. One of the, the concepts that we talked about was the fact that God doesn't just give us a twist ending to our story when we find Jesus. God rewrites our story. God comes into our story on this earth. And once we find Jesus, what we find him doing is going back into our past and showing us what really happened, what was really true all along. And that's so fundamental of a change for us. We're calling it a rewrite today. And if you were here last week, you saw that with Will's and with Molly's. Your story let me just say this. It's not ordinary. Some of you think that your story is ordinary. It's not. Your story has power. Look at this. And this is in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. So, so big. And they have defeated him. That him there, that's, that's the enemy. That's Satan. They defeated Satan by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. So it's talking about Christians here. It's talking about the church here and says that God gave us two big ways that we're going to defeat the enemy together. Number one is by the blood of Jesus, the fact that he forgives us by his amazing grace and we don't have to live in guilt or the fear of death anymore. Somebody say amen. 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 But number two, God gave us our story, our testimony. You're like, well, that's surprising. Why is our testimony, why is our story such a big deal? Again, I've just got an ordinary story. No, you don't. You've got a powerful story. Number one, because Jesus is in it. Amen? Because Jesus is in it. And if you saw Molly's last week, you saw Will's last week. I mean, I talked to a young man after third service who was trembling because God had moved so greatly in his life. And you see Jesus in people's stories and Jesus comes into 3D in a way that you'd never saw him before. And it goes beyond just teaching. It proves his existence in our lives. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says that we are God's workmanship. The, the New Living says we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. The Greek there is the word poema. We are God's poema. You are God's poema. We get the, the English word poem from that. You are God's story that he's telling in this world to point to Jesus. See, the events and the chapters of your story are meant to be powerful. They illustrate the grace of God. They don't illustrate how great you are. Did you know that? They illustrate how great he is. And you need your story and you need to share your story. So right now we're going to uh, share a story from Benny Elix Jr. And some of you guys know Benny. Uh, amazing guy. Amazing guy. And he is not here with us today because around 3 a.m. this morning, his wife had a baby. And I hope it's okay that I shared that publicly. Yes. Um, so here's Benny. Let's go ahead and play his story. I would say, I know, I know life before Christ was for sure a mess. You know, I was searching for identity, searching for, like, power, searching for um, like fulfillment, searching for, like, self-belonging, searching for a whole lot of things. And I never got any of it. Or if I did get any of it, it was a false, you know, uh, it was that, but false, kind of like fool's gold. You know, it was that, but, oh, fools, it, it's not real, you know, so. But church for me at that time was more of a hangout. It was more, hey, let's go, let's play some basketball. Let's, well, you know, who, who's going, you're going, I'm going, what's up, let's meet up there. It was more of that. It wasn't necessarily to learn. It wasn't, you know, I mean, of course I caught a Bible story here and there and, you know, Jonah in the well, just the basics as far as children's church goes, David and Goliath, I caught a few of them and kind of understood them for the most part, but there was no real relationship between me and you know, me and God. And then, um, you know, and during those years, I really, that's when I started doing that searching, searching for the power, searching for the identity. And I, and I searched, of course, in all the wrong places, searching for pleasure, stuff like that. And, you know, um, I began to steal. Like at a young age, I was still, I stole from my mom, 
I stole from cousins, sisters, friends, from stores, you name it, you know? And that was like, for me, it was like a thrill, like, oh, it's fulfilling, like, you know, oh, let me still not, you know, and I, and I rarely got caught, so it, it kinda, I kept going. You know, it's sometimes when you get caught doing something, you're like, oh, I just got in trouble. But when you don't get caught, you're like, hey, this is working. My techniques are, they're working, you know? So uh, that continued to grow, of course. Um, uh, pornography is another thing I got, uh, got entangled with. Um, you know, it started with a uh, look here, look there. And the next thing you know, it was like a daily thing, you know? And that was, of course, some of the pleasure, you know? Um, uh, what else? Um, anger carried around a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of unforgiveness from, you know, just, just life. You know, of course, uh, things happen in life, whether it's with your mom, cousin, or whatever, things happen and, you know, as now, we, we're called to forgive, you know, but at the time, you just bundle it up, keep it in there, you know, and I just carried a lot of anger, a lot of guilt, a lot of, just, just a lot of frustration. Carried a lot of that around and like a ticking time bomb, kind of. Um, uh, during those teenage years, I dropped out of school. I just lost motivation, period, you know. It grew, it grew, it grew, it grew. So I got, I got many stories as far as in that time frame, but a few that really stick out to me is one time, uh, maybe two or three years past, I got arrested and I, and I got a DUI. And I ended up spending three days in jail. Uh, it, was, it was on the 4th of July. It was back in 2014. And, uh, you know, I spent Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I got out Monday, like 7 p.m. And just being in there, I never thought, I never thought I'd be there, you know. But, you know, looking back, looking at the route I was on, of course, that's, that's where it ends up. But I never thought that I would be there. And um, I, that, that's when that feeling hit me again. I remember, um, we had phone calls, of course, when we were there, we had phone calls and, and I would call people and they wouldn't answer, wouldn't answer. And then one time I called my grandma, Miss Mary, who used to work at the church, by the way, shout out grandma. But um, she answered, I remember her saying, PJ, are, are you okay? And I remember just started crying, just crying. I couldn't even hold it anymore. And it was, and that's when that guilt hit me. Like, not only am I hurting myself, I'm hurting others. I'm hurting the people that love me, you know? My grandma, my mom, my, my sister, she was there the night I got arrested, my cousin. You know, it's just like, like this is no longer just affecting me, it's affecting loved ones, you know? And I would say that was the point to where it was just like, Benny, something's gotta change, you know? Um, and that was in 2014, so about, I believe it was February 2015 is when I decided to give my life to Christ. You know, that's when I decided, like, this, Benny, you, didn't you try enough? You don't get it yet? You know, these years, it wasn't like a one year, two year thing. It was a good, good chunk of time. I call it the ice age or the dark years. You know, either one, I like both of them. You know, they both work, but, uh, and that's when I said, Lord, you know what? I'm carrying all this, all this shame, all this mess, all these addictions now, all this sin here. You know, I don't have nowhere else to put it here. I don't know what else to do with it, here you go, you know? And that was the moment. Um, it was February about 2015, I got baptized, um, you know, gave my life to Christ, really gave it to him, you know? Um, and did I slip and fall from then? Did I mess up since then? Of course, you know, but that was the, you know, that was the time where I chose to follow him. I've been freed from the addictions, from the shame, the guilt. Um, right now I am, this month, actually May, it's May, right? May, I'm seven years, you know, marijuana free. Uh, in October, it'll be five years, like total sobriety from alcohol and just in general, um, free. Free from the pornography addiction, free from, from that. Um, uh, free, okay, it, it was, like whenever I first gave my life to Christ, I was under the impression of like perfection, of trying to do every single thing right. I, I, was, I, I really had the, the mind state of like, okay, I'm doing good, I'm doing good, and when I messed up, back to hell. Back to hell you go, Benny. Now earn your way back out. You know, I, I, I had that mind state of it. And there was this moment, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, 
or as we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so no one can boast. Once that, once God really, once I read it and, it, and God, the Holy Spirit really opened my eyes to that, it like unlocked something. You know, it, it, it really unlocked that, that freedom. It really unlocked those chains I, I was in. And ever since my life after Christ has looked free. It's looked like freedom. And also a sense of contentment, a sense of like, he is enough, you know, and, and just knowing that, of course, through scripture and, and going through that, you know, um, just knowing that he is enough. Christ is enough. You been giving some love today? Each of these stories is a person who's trusted us with their story. They, they've been courageous. They've been vulnerable. And th these stories are a gift to us. Amen? Amen? So there's two big ways that I see God rewriting Benny's story. The, the, the first way is when he said um, he took all of his shame, all of his mess, everything that was broken about his life, and he had quite a list, right? And, and, and he just said, here you go to God. So that's big. And then the whole like, Back to hell you go, Benny. Did you hear that part? Back to hell you go, Benny. So we're going to talk about those two pieces because I think they're both rewrites. So that first one, we say, here you go, God. We had some friends. Linda and I have some friends who, uh, they're, they're dual career family and, and super busy, and they have a cleaning service come to their house. And we've noticed with this family, what they'll do is before the cleaning service comes, They'll clean their house. Give you a minute. Right? Why do we do that? You got to clean the house before the cleaning service comes. And there's reasons. We do that with God. Before we come to the blood of Jesus Christ, that alone can cleanse us. Most of us think we've got to get our act together before we come to God. Most of us think that before we walk in the doors of a church, we've got to, we got to fix our mess. We got to fix us. We got to, we got to organize our life. Our family's out of control. We got to fix that so that we can look presentable. Maybe there's some pride there, but it's, it's on us, right? Let's see, there's so much in our life that's on us. We think this is on us too, and it's not. And so Benny comes and says, no, I, all that stuff that was broken, it wasn't on me. I just, I, I gave it to God. Here you go, God, he said. Do you know that that is a salvation prayer? It's a clumsy, human, simple salvation prayer. Amen? Like that's actually how it works. So let me read this verse to you and prove it to you. Luke 18, verse 13. This is Jesus talking. He says, The tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, This sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God that day. All the guy said was have mercy on me, O oh God, a sinner. And that was it. Are you glad for amazing grace today? Amen. You don't have to fix it before you come to God. And, and not only that, but please don't try because you'll never get there. You'll never feel clean enough and put together enough to come to God. And so you'll never find him. Just come Say, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, and I'll also say this. Uh, when he did that, and when Benny had that moment, he was saved, past tense. Did you see it in the verse? Uh, it's already gone, but in the verse it says, Jesus said, he was justified that day. Did you see the D on there? Justified, past tense, done. So you go and you say, God save me, and you're saved. And that's the way that the gospel works. Sometimes we have this, this perspective on God that, that when we come to Jesus, what happens is we say, hey, forgive my sins. And that's part of it. Hey, Jesus, forgive my sins. Forgive everything that I've done up until this point, my past. And that's part of it. But we think that that's all it is. And it's not all it is. You didn't just get clean one time. What happened is that you were adopted into the family of God. 
When you reach out to Jesus and say, save me, what happens is you get adopted into the family of God. Your status changes forever. That's why when you continue to sin into the future, you don't get pulled back to hell like Benny was afraid he was going to be. Because you're a son now. You're a daughter now. Does that make sense? You don't have to get resaved over and over and over again. When you come to Jesus Christ and, and you do this thing that Martin Luther called the great exchange, where you say, my broken life, here you go, God. And I want your new life in exchange. I want the life of Jesus in exchange. I want his purity, his holiness, his love, his mercy in my life. You do the great exchange. It's once and done. Once for all. And you don't have to re keep going back every single time that you fail. And you church kids in the room, you know exactly what I'm saying right now. Because here's what we do, right? Like we grow up in the church and we hear these testimonies. And here's how, how we usually hear the testimonies. Let's be real with ourselves, right? Usually it's like, here was my bad and broken and sinful life before I met Jesus. And here's how I found Jesus. And now that I found Jesus, everything is rosy now. I don't sin anymore. I don't fail anymore. My life isn't broken anymore. Everything looks and feels and sounds very Christian, right? And sometimes that is the very dangerously oversimplified version of our story that we give to people. And when you grow up in the church and you hear that version of the story over and over and over again, you think that's the, the version of the story that you've got to give people. And when you do fail, because you will, and when your life does get screwed up again, which it will, you feel like you've got to hide because it doesn't fit the narrative that you've put out there. Benny was so courageous today because he told us the actual truth. Amen. Look at this. This is Jude verse 24 through 25. Jude's only got one chapter. That's why there's not a chapter there. Technically, it's chapter one, whatever. Anyway, Jude. 24 through 25. Now all glory to God, he says, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our savior through Jesus Christ, the Lord. What he's saying there is not only is it the grace of God that saves you, it's the grace of God that keeps you. It's the grace of God that keeps you saved. You're like, wait a second, I thought I kept me saved. Nope. And if it was on you, you wouldn't get it done. No offense, but none of us would. You're just not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not holy enough. You're broken and in need of Jesus. Have I offended everybody? Okay. We're not the Savior. We're not God. Only He is. We are a people saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's what Benny quoted, not by works so that nobody can boast. You can never be a Pharisee in the kingdom of God. Yes? Um, last week, we had a prayer at the very end of the service. And I gave you an opportunity. If you had never decided to give your life to Jesus Christ yet in the great exchange, to be adopted into God's family, I gave you a chance to do that prayer at the end of the service last week. And some, so, several of you took advantage of that. I got to talk to some of you. It was an amazing week. I'm going to give you that opportunity again at the end of today's message. So if you weren't quite ready last week, you're going to be this week. Amen. All right, it's going to be so great. Um, next testimony we've got is from Tony Anders, and this is super impactful. Um, before we go into it, I just want to tell you a truth um, that I think is important for us to know. Mental health involves all of us, and you're going to see some stuff about mental health in this testimony right now. But I want to say this first. One out of nine people are on depression medication right now, and you're like, not in the church. And I say, yes, in the church. The mental health hotline grew 900% in the year 2020, their call volume. Antidepressant drug use is going up 300% every single year. There's a lot of reasons for that. One out of four young people considered suicide in 2020 alone. And the other generations, it was one out of nine. And again, some of you are like not in the church. Yes, in the church. 
And you're going to be tempted, maybe, as you listen to Tony's story unfold, to say, well, that's Tony. No, it's not. It's all of us. Yes? This is all of our issue, and it's our family's issue. And we've got to hear where Jesus is at in the midst of this. So uh, watch Tony's story unfold. My life before Christ, um, I was a very angry person. Um, I suffered from mental health, severe mental health. That stemmed from my childhood. Um, I didn't have a a great childhood. Um, I was adopted three times. I was um, in and out of foster homes. So the history of it is that uh, I was born March 1st, 1972 in South Vietnam in Saigon. My birth mother, who I do not know, or my birth father, I do not know, my birth mother couldn't take care of me, so she gave me up to a friend of hers. And at that time, her friend was dating an American soldier. And I guess they were in love. He wanted to bring her to the States. So how he could do that was by adopting me and bringing her. So he did that. You know, as a child, you you remember certain things growing up. The thing that I remember most was the abuse. Um, He was a very angry man. Um, He was abused a lot. So I guess that trend carried on me. Um, Prime example, everybody remember how they learned their ABCs, how I learned my ABCs, by he put me in the tub and he wanted me to repeat my ABCs after he said it, so I did. There were times that I messed up. He would turn on the water in the tub and put my face underneath the water with his hand over my mouth. So it basically was waterboarding me. I think I blacked out because I don't remember the rest. I remember there were times he got so mad at me that he would pick me up and throw me across the room. Um, he would hit me with anything, even his fist. You remember, I'm little. Um, he, they wind up getting a divorce. The abuse got worse to the point that one time he got so abusive with me that he threw me across the room and was stomping on me where I couldn't even breathe and couldn't move. And, and, I, and I know I passed out, I know I did. So the next day I, I ran away and went to a neighbor's house and told him. And um, that's when DHS came into custody. Even before all that, I was being abused by him. I was taken away several times. And um, the abuse that I received from him got worse when I got in the foster home. Because I was, um, this is tough. Uh, I was sexually molested when I was a kid in foster homes. Um, That's when I didn't want to live. I was 11 years old the first time I tried to commit suicide. But I didn't, you know. Something inside of me said, don't do it. And at the time, I think about it, it was Jesus who was telling me, don't, I love you. And I didn't know. You know, even when I was a kid, I, you know, I went to church, but I didn't felt like I belonged. I didn't, because I, I was made fun of because I didn't have the proper clothes, and, you know, I didn't, I wasn't clean, you know, because I wasn't allowed to take showers or baths. Um, when I was 13 years old, it got to the point where I had to run away from him, because if I didn't, I would probably have died, and I would have done it myself. I was living with friends to friends my senior year, you know, I still played football. Um, I didn't have the support. I didn't have the love. So I was basically just doing my thing, trying to get by. And then finally, before high school was over, I decided I'm going to join the Army, which was the best decision. Through all that process, growing up as a teenager, I was drinking. And I used that to numb myself because I didn't know how to express myself. I was told growing up, you don't express yourself. You don't show any type of emotion or anything. My wife, who I'm with now, we dated 
uh, like in 2005 or 2006, no, 2005. And uh, we broke up and we got back together in 2012. We got married April 24th of uh, 2014. We just celebrated our eighth year of marriage. Um, as the years went by, I was really struggling with depression. I did see a doctor, but she wasn't certified to give me the meds. She would just give me anything. And it just did not help. It made it worse. Over the years, my wife and I would get into arguments. I would get in her face, yell at her, say things that you shouldn't say, punch the wall, kick something that was on the trash can because I was so angry I couldn't control it. Thanksgiving comes around, 2018. I'm in a really bad spot. She has her family, her kids, and her uh, ex come over for Thanksgiving. You know, everything I put on this show that everything's fine, but in reality it wasn't. I was very standoffish. We got into an argument the week after Thanksgiving, and I told myself, you know what? You ain't gotta worry about this. So I went in the room, sat on my side of the bed, pulled out my nine millimeter, put the clip in it, pull the chamber, and point it towards my mouth. As I did that, I look up, and there was my wife standing there, crying. What are you doing? She said, can you please put it on safe, lower the gun, and take the round out? And I did, and I took the clip out, and I put it up. Eventually, she took the gun and hid it from me. That's when I said I need to get help. If I want to be in this marriage, and I really love her, I got to get help. And once I got help, I got on the right medicine through the VA. I noticed I started changing a little bit. But really, what really changed was one day, my wife, I woke up one Sunday morning, she was on her phone watching a sermon. Her niece, who lives in Alabama, goes to this church in Alabama. And they have it online where you could watch it live. So she was watching it and she said, hey, you, want, you know, anytime you want to watch it with me, you can. I said, oh, okay, I'm good, you know. I kind of blew it off. And then one day, I don't know, I just sat there and I said, okay, I'll watch a sermon with you. I got hooked. Um, it's Faith Church in Alabama, where Pastor uh, Steve, I believe that is. So we were watching it and over a year, uh, 2021, I looked at her and I said, we need to go to church. So we picked three churches. First church came up was Grace. I said, let's go to this church. Why not? So we go, and I remember walking in, I see people, this is during the summer, this is August. You got people in shorts, flip-flops, t-shirts. You don't see people in suits or dresses. You just come as you are. And I remember I was greeted by Brooke and Taylor, and then Taylor's husband. Uh, he greeted me and I remember, you know, we sat down and listened to the music and then the first thing I remember that made the biggest impression with Pastor Josh coming up there and the first thing he did was apologize for saying something that he thought maybe upset some people that he preached about. I never heard that before. That hit me. Because, you know, churches, a lot of the pastors don't socialize with the congregation at a level like he does. He makes you feel welcome. He makes you feel love. He knows you by your name. So we started attending, and then when it was brought up that there was gonna be a baptism, my wife and I said, well, let's get baptized together. So October 3rd, 2021, is when my new journey started, and we got baptized. Ever since then, what God has done for me is something that you people that are experienced the things that I went through are worse. Let God take over. God loves everybody. He don't care who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. Let that burden that you have, give it to him because that's what he wants. We are the one that tend to walk away from him. He never walked away from us. And the biggest thing that people need to understand, that fear, you know, it's a liar. It will stop you in your track from doing anything that you want, especially if it's something good. Believe in yourself. Most important, love yourself and let God love you. 
That's the most important thing, and you're not alone. It's okay to, to show emotions. It's okay to cry. It's okay to get help if you need it. And if people know somebody that suffers from mental health, the one thing from experience that I know of, show them that you care. That gift. Yep. That co courage and vulnerability is a gift to us again today. Um, uh, we're so thankful for, for Tony and for, for Bridget. Um, again, they overcame the evil one by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus and the word of their testimony. Do you see the power that's in it? Because we're experiencing the power that's in it right now. Um, there's something I need to say before we go any further into how God was rewriting Tony's story. That it, it's right here. Um, this is the Suicide and Crisis Hotline. Um, you dial 988 for this. Um, I'm going to unapologeti unapologetically stay here for a second. Take this in. This is a big deal. This right here is a gift of God to us. Anytime you're in crisis and you need to call somebody and have a live person on the phone to talk to that's trained, they're a professional, they can help you, you dial 988. Just like you would dial 911 for an emergency, you dial 988. Um, I'm just, I'm absolutely amazed at the resource that this is. And for some of you, you need to know this. Um, some dark night of the soul that you have, you're going to need to be able to have access to this or a loved one or a friend that you're trying to help. Um, I can tell you as a pastor, there was one specific time that I had a lady come into my office. And, and by the way, I'm not qualified in everything. Just because someone gave me a pastor title one day did not make me qualified in everything. Can I get a better amen for that? Um, and, and so uh, this woman walks in and I know her and she's a precious lady, precious sister. And she's been struggling with depression her whole life. And she's on medications. Her medications are off. She's, she's in this dark, dark season. And she comes in and she's just scared of herself. And as we talk through, it becomes clear to me that she's not just considering ending her life, but she's got ideas and she's got plans. And some of you guys know that's the, called the ideation phase. When you, where you start to um, make plans for how you might end your life, that's a whole other level. And as I was talking with her, we decided to call this number together. We put them on speakerphone, and a person picked up, and they were kind, and they knew what they were talking about. And they walked the two of us through the entire thing on what to do next. It was a very, very good experience. I just want to give my testimony to that because you need that. Um, if, if you need to be reminded of that, that's out at the Connect desk after the service as well. But there's some resources here for you. The very next resource I want to give you is this book called Out of the Cave. I don't have time today to really walk you through a lot of practical steps on how to deal with depression and even thoughts of suicide. But I want to give you this as a resource source. That's a QR code. You can get to the Amazon link uh, that way. But this book was written by a precious pastor named Chris Hodges, wonderful guy with a wonderful church. But he has been very open with the public about the fact that he struggles with depression himself. And that's going to be shocking news for some of you, because some of you have been taught that if someone's a pastor or if they're deep in their faith and strong with Jesus, then mental health issues just seem to disappear. That's not true. That's not true. And so he wrote a book about what the Bible says about how to walk with depression in a healthy way. The next set of books, how to heal from suffering and how to walk through seasons of suffering. When you yourself or someone you love is in the furnace, and I mean in the furnace of suffering, um, sometimes we give each other oversimplified answers, do we not? And they're not helpful. Um, God orchestrated a, a little coincidence. I'm going to call it a coincidence. Um, this past week, putting this message together, and I just happened to run into a friend of mine who's a Christian counselor in Lawton. And I told him about this message and some of the issues that we we're going to be ta talking about. And I'm like, you know what? Some of us, when we go through this stuff, we don't think that we are worth much to God because 
our life experiences have kind of driven in this idea of you're all alone and you're not worth very much. How do I help people understand in this short sermon that they're worth something to God and that they're not alone? How do I do that quickly? And his answer to me was, don't you dare. Don't you dare oversimplify something that is very, very complex. Don't you make something seem simple and quick that is a lifelong struggle. Instead, we need to suffer with each other. We need to be patient with each other in the church. And we need to not minimize things that are very, very difficult that we are walking with. The church has got to get better at mental health conversations. Mental health is a struggle like any other struggle. I mean, I'm looking around this room and some of you guys have got glasses on. Did you know that God designed you with perfect eyeballs? And today your perfect eyeballs are not functioning perfectly. And so what's going on is you are thankful to the Lord in heaven who gave men wisdom to design eyeglasses so that you could see. Amen? Amen. Amen. And then you take ibuprofen and you take allergy medication and you are thankful for the grace of God in those pills to help you be all you can be. Amen? Amen. So why do we have some kind of weird stigma about mental health? Why do we look at people whose brains won't adjust and balance the chemicals appropriately, who take medication in order to have better health? And we oversimplify the issue and we tell people to, why don't they cheer up? We tell people, why don't they have more faith? Why don't they have more hope? We have to get better at this conversation in the church. I mean, here's the deal. I've struggled with depression. I've struggled with anxiety personally. I've had episodes. I've had seasons, short seasons. But I have not carried a chemical imbalance through my life like I know some people who have carried a chemical imbalance through their life. And it is a struggle on a different level. And we do not fight the same battles on the same level playing field. Stop acting like we do because we don't. We've got got to get rid of this weird stigma in the church. The church should be a place where it's healthy to talk about these things. Why? Because our Lord loved us where we were. Why in the world wouldn't we love each other where we are? Amen? We've got to do that. We've got to respect each other where we are. And and by the way, your disease and, and your struggles, they are not your identity today. They're not so big that they are who you are. They are just your struggles. And I know they're massive, but they're your struggles. And Jesus has healing for you. We've been talking about the fact that God rewrites our story. And there's, there's one big way I want to give to you that I believe God came in to rewrite the story of Tony. And I think it's big for us as well. Again, as, as you watch his whole story unfold and your heart breaks over it, you can just imagine how alone our brother felt as he went through all these different episodes. Simone Wheel said this. She said, affliction or suffering makes God appear to be absent for a time. More absent than a dead man. More absent than the light in the utter darkness of a cell. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt in the midst of your own suffering that that meant God wasn't there? I think it's a little bit of how we all feel. But God was there in Tony's story. Did you see God? I think the biggest place I see God in Tony's story is when Bridget shows up. Why was he rescued? Because God brought her there. And why did she love him? And why did she hide his gun? Because Jesus was in that. He was not alone. God proved his presence through the love of his wife. I love that. There's an Old Testament story, powerful story. Um, 
Did you ever learn about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as kids? And you struggled to say the names just like I did. And it's like there's this, there's this wild story, right, where they refuse to bow to this pagan king because he's not God. We're not going to bow to him. The king says, I'm going to throw you into this furnace and you'll be burned up instantly. You'll die. And they refuse. They're like, go ahead and kill us. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, we also struggle to say his name as kids. King Nebuchadnezzar, he throws the three of them into the furnace. And let me read this, this passage to you. Daniel 3, 24, but suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement. This is after they threw him in the furnace and he exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see, how many? Four men. I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed. And the fourth looks like a God. And he says the fourth looks like an avenger. That's what he's saying. Because he doesn't know what to think? This old pagan ancient God does not, or, or king does not know what to make of it. This is probably Jesus in his pre-incarnate form showing up in the fire. You know what's crazy about this story? Is in most of the stories when somebody who God loves needs to be rescued, God rescues them. In this story, it's different. In this story, God comes into the fire with them. With them. He's in the furnace with them. Bridget was in the furnace with him. And through Bridget, God was showing that he was in the furnace with Tony. Do you see it? What do we remember every single year at Christmas that Jesus is called? Emmanuel, which means God with us. Why is that his name? Because we are constantly Tempted to believe that we are alone in our suffering. Why is Jesus like no other religion and no other God? Because he came to be with us. He came to walk in our shoes and to live our life and to be tempted and to suffer in every single way that we've been tempted and that we suffer all the way to a cross. Why does this matter? Because it's what we need. Some of you have been handed a theology. Some of you have been handed an understanding of life that if you just believe Jesus stronger, then all your suffering will disappear. And if you just have enough faith and if you just give enough money to certain ministries, that all your problems will disappear. And it's a lie. It's a lie. The suffering Savior knows nothing of that. It's not the gospel and it's not the truth. There are wonderful times that God comes and he rescues us. But there are many times and there are many people that I'm looking at right now in this room. You're in the middle of a furnace right now and you haven't been rescued out of it. And you don't understand why. And what I'm telling you is reread the gospels and know again and again and again that Jesus came to walk in your shoes because that's what Jesus does. Did you ever have to learn common core math? It's awful. Awful. It's a furnace all its own. And our kids are growing up and they're having to learn this math and they're at the dining room table and they're having to do their homework and they're struggling. And do you know what's easy to do? What's easy to do is to say, I had to struggle too when I was learning math. It's good for you while you've got the TV on, it'll make you stronger while you turn to the next channel, right? That's what's easy. What Linda Trueblood did is she'd get up and she'd go to the dining room table alongside them and she'd do the work with them, not do the work for them. That's a whole other problem. Not do the work for them. 
but she'd be there with them. Why? Because that's love. We think sometimes the only version of love that we want is a solution to our problems. The only love that we want, America has told us, that it's the removal of our pain so that we can be happy. It's not biblical. Love is that God comes, Emmanuel, and he enters into our pain along with us. He's the Bridget in the room who hides the gun and says, please put the safety on. He's there with us. What's your furnace today? What's your furnace? You're in the middle of the furnace of an ugly divorce right now. God is with you there. You're in the furnace of bipolar disorder today. You're in the furnace of depression. You're in the furnace of anxiety. You're in the furnace of cancer. It's not just a trial. The fire's burning so hot, you don't know how you can stand it a day longer. I, I know you're, that, you're out there. Chronic pain. And the doctors are saying you'll deal with this for the rest of your life. Yes? Some of you, it's addiction that won't go away. It's loneliness. It's crippling debt. What's your furnace? He's with you. He's with you in the furnace. Say he's with me. In the furnace. He's with me in the furnace. Let's stand. Jesus Christ is so good. He's beyond anything you ever imagined. Sometimes he's not what you want him to be. He transcends it all. There's no quick solutions. You need to follow him all your life. You've been brainwashed in a lot of lies and he needs to unbrainwash you Every single story that you've heard these last two weeks, we say it's been rewritten. You've got to get rewritten. I want to pray a prayer over you. We're not going to make you come up front. We're not going to make you raise hands, do any of that stuff. But if today's your day, and you're like, I want to be in the family of God. I want to get adopted into the family of God. I want to be saved in a way that I can never be unsaved again. If that's you today, I'm going to pray a prayer right now, phrase by phrase. And this is not a magic prayer. You don't say these exact words to God because he can x-ray your heart. He sees right through to your soul. And so if you start offering yourself to him, he knows where you are. He's given you a choice. So if you're choosing him now, feel free to join in this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Past, present, future. I want to be done with shame. Give me a clean slate, Lord. Come into my life. Adopt me into the family. Give my life to you. Be my king. Be my savior. I want a new life. Thank you for filling me. Thank you for that clean slate. Be the healer. Be my purpose. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Now let me pray for those of you who are in the furnace. And I'm also going to pray for those of you who are loving someone in the furnace. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, of, of your example. 
that you are Emmanuel, you are God with us. Thank you that you were there in the furnace for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Lord, I pray for a deep healing for my brothers and sisters all across this room. And God, I tremble even to pray it. I don't want to make it sound easy or simple. But Jesus, you can heal us. God, you can reform us, reshape us like clay. God, so that we can we can get deprogrammed from all the lies of the world, God. We can get reprogrammed, God, to understand what the truth is in your word. And we can start to walk with Jesus. And, and we can find that, that little bit of healing every single day, God, that you've got for us. And we can not feel so alone anymore. And God, some of us are going to break free. Some of us are going to get an amazing miracle today. In the name of Jesus, bring those miracles today. God, cause us to learn, cause us to have conversation, cause us to bring down the walls and let family in, family that wants to love us, that wants to help us. God, free us from our judgment today in the church. Make us more healthy with that, God. I pray that we would respect the journey of each other today in the church. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.